I'm Hugh Sherman, and now we're going to talk about corporate level strategy. As we talked about before, a firm's profitability is determined by two questions. The first one is, what industries are we going to compete in? And the second one is, once we make the choice of industries, how are we going to compete in those specific industries? Corporate level strategy is all about the first question. Corporate level strategy is actually answering three questions. The first question is, what is the scope of the firm? Which are the businesses that we are going to compete in? The second question is the nature of those relationships between the businesses. What are the skills or knowledge that we can leverage and take from one business and apply it to a second business? And then the third question is, how are we going to allocate the financial resources across those businesses? Uh, which of those businesses do we consider to be the priority that will receive the majority of our investment funds? An example is Bacardi's Corporation. Uh, it was founded in the early 1860s, and believe it or not, it's still a family-owned business today doing more than $6 billion. When it was originally founded, it was involved, they, the corporate level strategy was defined as being in the light spirit business, just being in rum. However, in uh, the 1990s, the Picardi family started to acquire other businesses. Their first acquisition was Martini and Rossi, the Italian vermouth maker and maker of sparkling wines. In 1998, the company acquired Dewar Scotch and Bombay Sapphire. And then in the 2000s, it started making more acquisitions, including the French vodka manufacturer Grey Goose. Um, what this indicates is that the business is highly related. Uh, each of those, each of those um, liquors can be distributed through the same sales force and to the same types of outlets that they're sold in. And then secondly, in terms of what is the priority business, even to this day, the Bacardi family um, defines rum as being the priority business. So rum still receives the majority of the attention from the, the management of the company. A second example is Sony Corporation. This is a company that's become today a, a global conglomerate. And they did this through different avenues. They have uh, made acquisitions and they've also relied heavily on developing alliances. In the 50s through the 70s, the firm was concentrated in being a consumer electronics producer. It produced many of the, you know, it, it produced the Walkman, the first color TV, um, the first tape recorder. And then in the 1980s, as the world market became much more competitive, uh, Sony felt the need to start diversifying in terms of their product scope as well as geographically. They purchased uh, CBS from Columbia Pictures and they developed several different alliances. For example, one of their first alliances was with Nintendo, where they produced, together they produced a video game console. Um, in about 2003, uh, Nintendo left the venture, and so Sony started manufacturing its own PlayStation, which took over 70% of the world market share for, for game consoles. Uh, another alliance that Sony did was with Apple Computer that was not as successful. They developed the first digital uh, assistant, which was the Newton. Um, several years later, they had an alliance with Intel to produce a... Uh, a joint development of a personal computer that blended Intel's chip technology with Sony's expertise in designing innovative electronic devices. This also was not uh, successful. In 2005, the company was doing very poorly and the stock price was less than 50% of what it was in 2000. So the company was forced to hire its first non-Japanese CEO and this person, um, Howard Stringer, was forced to uh, restructure the firm, concentrating, selling off many of the uh, unrelated products and becoming much more focused on the original uh, consumer electronics. This slide shows the, you know, the choices that a strategist has for structuring economic relationships. When we talk about a firm, um, we are really determining what are the boundaries that the organization, when we talk about corporate strategy, we're really talking about what are the boundaries that that organization will have. If, you know, in, in certain situations, we can determine that the market is performing properly, 
then that would be a function that we can leave outside of the boundaries of the organization so it can rely on the market to determine the best price. And we would do this in many cases when we're buying a commodity product. As we go along the continuum, on the right-hand side, if the, if the function or product that we're buying in the marketplace is critical to our success, then we would actually acquire or internalize that function and make it part of the organization. So we have a whole range of options from relying on the market to developing a long-term contract, developing an alliance with a firm, or actually purchasing 100% of the equity of the firm and internalizing it within the organization. Transaction costs are um, the costs of actually monitoring that relationship we have with performing a certain function. Um, so as we were talking about before, you can see that you know, if we rely on the market um, to perform the function that we need, you know, the incentive is very clear. And, but the, the disadvantage is, is that the cost of creating and monitoring the compliance of an outside vendor is much higher. If we bring it within the organization, we have the advantage is that we control it. Um, we have clear lines of authority and we can coordinate the activities that are involved with that function um, because it's ours. The disadvantage is the costs are higher because we have managers and we have to coordinate it within our bureaucracy. Interestingly, over time, there's been a, a trend with regards to whether we rely on the market or whether we internalize the function. Up until the 1980s, the trend was that we would acquire that function and internalize it so that we could control it. Uh, but what has happened since, that, since the 1980s is that more and more firms have found that it's cheaper, less costly for us to actually rely on the market and purchase it outside. So if you look at you know, what's happened with many corporations over time is that they've relied increasingly on outsourcing of different functions and that they have been divesting themselves of different businesses that they felt were not critical to their success. This chart lays out the four uh, generic corporate level diversification strategies. Uh, relatedness can range from being very high, where the, the corporation's different businesses that they're competing in are within the same industry, to a relatedness that is very low where all of the corporation's units are competing in very different industries. Procter & Gamble is an example of a company that is highly related. Um, they use uh, what they're known for, of course, is their, their marketing and their, their brand, their ability to develop brands. Um, what they do is that they can leverage that knowledge across different kinds of industries, such as personal care and food products. Dominant businesses are a strategy that where the firm competes basically in the same industry. Uh, 90 to 95% of all the revenues are coming from one market. An example of that would be something like Anheuser-Busch. A related constrained diversifier. This is a, a diversification strategy where we are sharing a, a, some kind of a knowledge. The example that I have here is with Kodak. Um, they have a certain chemical and imaging knowledge that they can leverage across film and medical equipment as an example. A related linked diversifier is, a, um, is where a firm uh, diversifies across different um, activities in the value chain. So for example, if you were talking about an energy company, um, they would be a related linked diversifier and they would have a, a um, oil exploration business a refining business, and a, they could have retail outlets, gas stations that they sell their final product to. That would be different activities in the value chain. And then the fourth one is an unrelated diversifier, which we call a conglomerate. Um, there is, as I was mentioning before, the trend has been away from unrelated diversifiers and more towards related uh, firms. The, uh, the most successful unrelated diversifier is General Electric. They're involved in a host of industries, anything from light bulbs to plastics to um, you know, uh, uh, electric turbines or aircraft engines. 
This is an example of uh, Walt Disney's diversification strategy. In the early years, they were concentrated in their core business, which was animated films and theme parks. Over time, as they were trying to grow, they developed other related businesses, such as motion pictures and TV programming. And then in later years, they started moving into uh, more unrelated diversification, uh, which included TV broadcasting, real estate, um, cruise lines. Their profitability has suffered in, in recent years, in the mid-2000s, and so what has happened is that they've started to divest themselves of those unrelated businesses. They've given up, sold off much of their real estate business, um, and um, they have been concentrating a lot more on the animated films and theme parks. We've been talking a lot in this seminar about the resource perspective of firms. With regards to corporate strategy, you can see that we talk about related diversification. It's highly related to the resource perspective. Um, we're talking about making sure that when we diversify into other industries, we have some kind of knowledge base or resources within the firm that we can use to leverage and justify our moving into other industries. When we acquire other firms, we should be able to justify it on the basis of whether we're utilizing skills and knowledge that we have within our own industry, and now we'll be able to apply it to the new acquisition, or whether when we're buying that new acquisition, it's going to help us to gain a new knowledge base that we can bring back to our, our existing business. And so in conclusion, the corporate strategy defines and manages the boundaries of a organization. It defines the industries in which the corporation will continue to operate. And business organizations are really vehicles to facilitate economic transactions. And these boundaries then of the organization must be designed so that they can make economic transactions the most efficient. And lastly, there's four key generic diversification strategies that we talked about. And these are strategies for achieving external growth and determining the resource allocation between the businesses that we're operating in. The four diversification strategies are dominant business, related constrained, related linked, and unrelated diversifiers.